What is up, everybody? Welcome back into another episode of the Two Stripes Podcast. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host for the Two Stripes Podcast, and I am coming to you from Boulder, Colorado on January 17th, 2017. Not a lot's gone on since the last time we talked. Basically, the only thing was the national championship game, and what a game it was with Clemson beating Alabama in the final seconds of the game to claim their first national championship since the 80s and deny Alabama what would have been their fifth national championship since 2009. So congratulations to Clemson and their fans, and I look forward to all of the stories this offseason about how Alabama's dynasty is now dead. Should be a lot of fun. Other than that, though, not a ton going on in college football news. We got signing day, which is about two weeks away. But this is usually the quiet time in college football's offseason. So what better time to get back into the Two Stripes podcast offseason series, focusing on teams that didn't make a bowl game this season and where they stand heading into next year and what their future prospects are. And for this episode, it is Iowa State. The Cyclones went 3-9 and nine last season, 2-7 and seven in the Big 12 in head coach Matt Campbell's first season in Ames after coming over from Toledo and have a lot of young players on offense, a lot of skill position talent back for next season. Have to replace a lot on the offensive and defensive lines, but there is definitely enough there to warrant some improvement heading into 2017. So it should be a fun program to watch. I know probably a lot of people that aren't Iowa State fans are, don't know a lot about them but they definitely have some intriguing pieces there. And Matt Campbell, if nothing else, is a rising name in the head coaching ranks and one that put together a really solid resume at Toledo. And despite going 3-9 and nine in his first season, I think that there was enough there to warrant at least watching what Iowa State does in the coming years for Matt Campbell and to see kind of where he ends up if you aren't an Iowa State fan. So to get some info on the Iowa State football program and to see where they're headed in the future, I was joined on the podcast by Matthias Schwarzkopf of WideRightNattyLight.com, SB Nation's Iowa State blog. And we talked for about 20, 25 minutes. And he talked about some of the changes that Campbell's brought to the team and the program from a recruiting standpoint and how he kind of differs from Paul Rhodes and some of the other regimes that have been in Ames. We also talked a lot about the offense's potential in 2017 and quarterback Jacob Park, the former Georgia recruit, very highly touted kid coming out of high school who ended up at Iowa State and is now their starting quarterback and how his development is very key to the future of that offense and how if he takes another step in his development and the offensive line gives them decent play that there's skill position talent out wide and at running back that's sneakily good. Iowa State could have a very quietly good offense next season. We also talked about the defense and in particular how the front seven is going to play a major role in whether they can not only improve on defense but might actually be the key for them making a bowl game in 2017 and talked about Matt Campbell and the coaching staff deciding to go the JUCO route on the defensive line to replace, I think, the five guys that they lost after this season and how they kind of fit in to the program and what they need to be able to do to give Iowa State decent defensive play and to match kind of what their offense is able to do. On that note, let's get right into it. Here's Matthias Schwarzkopf of Wide Right Natty Light. Joining me on the Two Stripes podcast is Matthias Schwarzkopf of Wide Right Natty Light. Matthias, how are you doing today? And secondly, are, are you a Natty Light guy? Is that your beer choice? Um, I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me on. A uh, pleasure to talk with somebody else other than Cyclone fans normally. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's been a little icy and cold here in Iowa, so we're we're getting through. And I used to be a, a Natty Light guy. I still drink it from the time to time, but that was my primary beer beer in college because it was cheap and you know you get away with a lot of things drinking some Natty Light. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I know personally, I'm I'm a Bush Light guy, and like 
I was Keystone throughout college, but now it's it hasn't even moved up. It's just Bush Light, and I don't drink a ton of natural light, so I don't know like on the scale of where that compares to Bush Light, but I think it's pretty similar. I'd say it's a little bit below Bush Light because I'm a primary Bush Light drinker now myself. That's kind of like the beer of choice in Iowa. I saw a map one time that had the top top candies in each state. And for Iowa, it was Bush Light, so that goes to say a lot there. Well, if anybody takes anything from this podcast, it is that Bush Light is good. And what is also good is Matt Campbell, the current head coach at Iowa State, went 3-9 and nine this year, but comes from Toledo, where I think his record was 35-15. and 15. He was, He's very good in the Matt Conference, a rising young name, and joined on for his first season up at the Power 5 level at Iowa State. And despite the 3-9 and nine record, there, there were some times where I Iowa State really flashed this year and what what was your overall perception of this season and how Iowa State played in his first season? Uh, I, I think we all kind of figured this season would be kind of one of those ones like similar past uh, the last few seasons of Paul Rhodes era. Um, we knew he wouldn't technically be there at a bowl game level but you know the three games that I always come back to when we talk about this prior season was the Northern Iowa game, Baylor, and Oklahoma State. Each game where we held leads late in the fourth quarter and it all dwindled away you win those three games you're in a bowl game and that you know that would have been something that would have been huge in year one of Matt Campbell era you know it just would have helped for with recruiting and you know it's overall confidence going forward you know there were some positives and there was also some negatives you know there's early in the season there was penalties you know things that just they bit themselves in the foot and you know the Iowa game that was just a complete blunder in itself but you know they showed that they can compete at this level and you know we were playing 18 to 22 redshirt freshmen or true freshmen and that's high compared to what it was in the Rhodes era where he would typically go to the veteran players and it goes to show that Matt Campbell would put the best player on no matter what position or you know their age it was if they're the better person or player in that spot they would play so I think going forward that's just going to be something that will help them try to get back to that bowl game level you know best player plays and there's no favorites here and you mentioned some of the close losses they had single digit losses to UNI Baylor Oklahoma State Kansas State and then they put up a pretty good fight against Oklahoma only losing by 10 and with the amount of like you said redshirt freshmen and younger players they had was it like trying to balance out a level of frustration with man they're they're really close to breaking through and like hey this this is really good for the future you think that 2017 might be the year so was it kind of like a year where you have to balance out being frustrated with youth but also looking at how they played against some of those teams which Oklahoma State Kansas State OU obviously those aren't bad teams and they played very well in those games I mean for myself personally it was I you know we understood who was going to be out there in the field I mean game one against Northern Iowa you saw young players that you know were redshirt freshmen or even true freshmen coming in so you knew what type of things were going to happen there they're, they're going to be the penalties they're going to be the frustration plays that get you know us a little bit angry but you know the typical fan you know they they want that success right away and they think that they're playing at the power five level they should be Peyton Manning or you know whatever you, the equivalent of that level so from my perspective at least you know it's it's good to see younger players and it's going to build for the future and which is what Matt Campbell needs and it's not it wasn't so much about winning now for me I wanted to see younger guys out there getting reps, getting experience, because that's just going to help so much more down the road. What kind of things does Matt Campbell bring that maybe Paul Rhodes didn't, or even, you know, you look back into the past at what Iowa State's had over the last couple of decades. What differentiates him between all of those coaches that have been in names before him? I think it's the ability to connect with the younger players. Paul Rhodes was kind of one of those guys that, you know, he's a little bit older. He's been through so many generations of coaching years that he was pretty much set in his ways and he didn't really adapt to what the the growing trends in college football were. And, you know, kind of like uniforms, every college has different uniforms. The younger players nowadays, they like that kind of thing. The social media thing, Matt Campbell's big on that. Um, It's just getting your program's name out there where, you know, under Paul Rhodes, it just, it's something that didn't flash out in the social media or, you know, resonate with the younger guys. I think that's kind of been the biggest standpoint that's helped Matt Campbell so far, especially in recruiting, that he's been able to connect with these younger guys and the ability to connect with them has led them to get to campus. And it, the thing is that Iowa State has struggled with is getting, you know, bigger name players or players that are able to compete at the power five level right away, getting them to campus on recruiting trips. I mean, once you get somebody here to Ames that, you know, they're going to see our facilities are top notch compared to, I mean, they're not going to be Alabama or Ohio State level type of thing, but, you know, they're 
you know, maybe the level below that. And it's just other schools our size or, you know, who haven't had the great football success, you know, we're, our facilities are better than most of those. Where it looked like from the outside perspective that Iowa State made their biggest jump in Campbell's first year was offense. They went from 66th in offensive S&P Plus up to 48th this season. And a lot of those dudes, especially at the skill position with Jacob Parks at quarterback, you have Joel Lanning back there at quarterback as well that adds a little bit more of a running threat. Alan Lazard might be the best receiver in the country that nobody talks about. And then you have at least two guys at running back who have major experience but who are still young. What's the outlook for the offense next season and, and just like from my perspective I, I I don't watch a ton of Iowa State but it seems like this is the most firepower they've had in a really really long time would you agree with that I, I would definitely agree with that and it's, it's all gonna it's all gonna come back to that offensive line where you know it took them six games or so to get continuity up front and once they finally did, you know, you Jacob Park had time to throw. Jacob Lanning had lanes to run. And you know, David Montgomery was getting holes to run through. And, you know, Mike Warren, he was a little hampered by injuries. And, you know, kind of his confidence was a little bit low just because of the assurgence of David Montgomery. But with Jake Campos coming back on at tackle and with the plugging in of Dave Dawson potentially as guard spot, and they, they're looking at some other a grad transfer to plug another guard spot. You know, this could be one of the best offensive lines on paper, at least that could be nasty enough to compete, you know, with the big 12 defensive lines. And they'll just, you know, add to that firepower where, you know, Jacob Park, you know, he has elite skills as a quarterback. He just, you know, he, he needed time this year to get back into that game where, you know, he left Georgia, went to community college and he was out of, you know, out of football for a year. And, it, you know, you could tell it just took some time to get some feet, get his feet under him. And once he did, you know, he showed those skills of what makes him, is going to make him a good quarterback. You know, Joe Lanning, or as a runner, he's a thrower, you know, he struggles in some of that kind of aspect, but he just had the dimension to the offense where he could put even Park and Lighting on the field at the same time. You don't know what the heck's going to happen. So, you know, Iowa State does have that firepower, and on paper at least it shows that this could be one of the most explosive offenses that Iowa State's had in a long time. On the subject of Jacob Park, he was a kid that went to Georgia out of high school, a very highly touted blue chip recruit, I think the the fifth ranked pro style quarterback in that class when he came in and took that year off and now at Iowa State. And he kind of flashed as the season went on and you, you could see that he was getting better. What does he need to do to take that next step in his development and be one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12? You know, I you know, I was talking to one of our other writers that he studies a little film, a little more hardcore than I do. And I think it's just going to be one of those things that he's going to have to be the student of the game where he preps week long and he knows what he's going to face coming in a, on game day and not making those mental mistakes that we've seen quarterbacks in the past that Iowa State's had where they're, you know, throwing in the double coverages when they know they're going to be there, things like that. He has a little couple foot, you know, footwork, mechanical flaws to work on, but he keeps his head downfield all the time. And it's just something that we haven't had in the quarterback here at Iowa State since the early 2000s where, you know, they're tucking and running and don't matter if, you know, somebody else comes open later on. You know, you watch Jacob Park, his eyes are always downfield. Even when he's on the run, he's going to look to make the next play. Even if he can't get it on his feet, he's going to he's going to throw one to find an open receiver. So I think it's just going back to it. He's going to have to be a student of the game make sure he prepares well and, you know, just gets better as the next two seasons go on for him. And yeah, like we've seen some of these other quarterbacks under, especially Paul Rhodes, where we thought they were the next Seneca Wallace almost, and then they just flat out bailed out on us. So that's what I'm kind of looking forward into him. Well, and with some of the weapons that he has, I mentioned Lazard, who is awesome, and it's huge that he's coming back for his senior season. You talked about Mike Warren and some of the struggles he had this year. I don't know if a lot of people outside of Ames or even the Big 12 know that this is a kid that rushed for over 1,300 yards as a freshman, and David Montgomery steps in in his place with the injuries this year and had a pretty good freshman season, not quite the numbers, but just you, you look on a per carry basis, I think averaged over five yards per carry is highlight yards per carry were pretty good. What's the situation at running back looking like in if the offensive line gives them not even like great play, but just good solid play and doesn't get Jacob Park killed and opens enough holes for the running game? What's the ceiling for the offense in 2017? You know, I think they could be middle tier, even just a little touch better than, you know, the Big 12 ranks goes. I mean, you're always going to have Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. They're going to put up big yards, big numbers. 
who knows what Baylor's going to have this year with their new coach. It, you know, things are up in the air with them. So as in terms of offensive numbers go, they have a shot to be up there, but it's just a matter of who shows up, what the offensive line's going to look like. I mean, I think they're going to get theirs. It's just depending how much. And then like, like I said, it's just all going to depend on that, how that offensive line looks. And we've seen it with Mike Warren, especially in his freshman year. I mean, our offensive line wasn't that great. I mean, he just found holes and win, and that's the biggest thing where I thought this year the holes weren't there right away, and I think the confidence shot down, and he was getting down on himself, and, you know, he heard the whispers outside of the team, you know, people are wondering what's wrong with Mike Warren. It never really got the the wheels turning on the season fully, and, you know, that's where we saw David Montgomery come in and kind of take a little stride away from him. So this offense has a chance to be really good, and it's just, like I said, it all hinges on that offensive line like it always does. Flipping to the defensive side of the ball, they lose a lot on the offensive line and on the defensive line as well. They lose a ton. 95th in S&P Plus last season, and they lose, I think, five guys off that defensive line. But Campbell's opted to go the Juco route to fill some of those voids at defensive end and defensive tackle. How big of a role are those guys going to need to play for this defense to rebound? Because if there's one area they really struggled with on defense, and it's not like they were great overall, but they really had a hard time against the run. And is it imperative? Like, if they want to go to a bowl game, are those guys, those Juco's going to have to step in right away and have success? Yes, that is 100% true. I think just because of the fact that some of these guys that have been in the program that are there now that are would be considered backups from the previous year on the defense line, they just aren't battle tested. And I think some of these guys that are coming in from the JUCO level, especially Ray Lima, he looks like he's Big 12 ready and can compete with some of these offensive lines we're going to see. And if we don't have those guys coming in starting day one or even making a huge impact, it's going to be a long season because on the back end of our recruiting and we're, I mean, we're still hampering on that defensive line, finding younger guys that aren't necessarily Juco level, but incoming freshmen here a little bit longer, you know, those guys typically aren't going to be ready day one. So with the losses that we had, these guys are going to have to come in day one and be able to ready, be ready to compete right away. And it seems like if they get good play out of that front seven and especially that defensive line, they have enough coming back in the back end. And when you look at the Big 12, it's obvious other teams, basically everybody likes to air the ball. They like to throw the ball around. And Iowa State had one of the more active secondaries in the country. They rank 15th in defensive back havoc rate. And they have a lot of those guys coming back. What makes them so active and so good? I think it's just the athleticism that they have. And you can even see it with what he's recruiting so far, too. I mean, it's it's not so much that they have one player that really sticks out. I mean, people people notice that we just we we interchange a lot on the defensive side and the secondary especially we got multiple guys coming in and out there's not one guy just staying on the field all the time and i think that's what's contributed to at least be able to have us in the games at some points you know we we have great depth in the secondary we're going to have great depth in the secondary for you know at least a few years here to come especially the way he's recruiting so i think in the biggest biggest type of thing like that especially when you have the high powered buying offenses that the big 12 have and they're going to go fast and guys are going to get tired you have to have the ability to interchange some people and get guys some rest otherwise it's going to be a long way so i think that's what kind of the biggest factor for the secondary is that at least that their ability to fly around the ball is that they can move one guy out and bring him in and you get the same kind of production there's been some whispers about kamari cotton Moy and his status with the program is there any update on that is is he gonna leave is he gonna stay and you talked about the depth if he does decide to transfer is, is that something that they can sustain with some of the depth they have on the back end uh starting out with what he's coming back uh as of right now they say it's 50 50 but i think it's leaning more toward him coming back the rumor mill has him spinning that he uh interviewed for a internship here names over the summer so like he you know it's all signs point to him coming back as of right now i mean even if he were to decide to transfer i think they'll be all right just because of the depth they have and potential of cam white coming in and playing safety next year as well and another potential recruit coming in that he hasn't chosen his school but if he does he has the ability to play right away too so it would hurt certainly kamari cotton moya's cover skills have kind of been here and there it just depends which game he wants to show up but he's an elite tackler so i mean you'd be missing that kind of skill set from him but it's not a void they can't fill 
you brought up uh, the recruiting and kind of how Matt Campbell has has played a huge role in, in turning that around and getting bringing in more talent and being able to relate to players and kids coming out of high school better than maybe Paul Rhodes and his staff were able to. Right now, 45th in the 24-7 composite, 22 commits, 6th in the Big 12. I, I don't pay a ton of attention to what Iowa State's doing on the recruiting trail, but is this like a complete jump up from what they've done previously? Um, last year... We had the highest rated recruiting class that Iowa State's ever seen. And I went back and looked at some of the spots. And just to kind of, Paul Rhodes' last year, I think we were ranked like 57th. And the year before that, like 60th. So I think we're going to be in that kind of area for now until we start winning a lot more games. I mean, even if we can hold on to the top, you know, top 50 spot, that's just going to be huge. It's just a matter of, you know, you've seen teams like, hate to say it, but Iowa out of all teams, you know, they bring in those level three star recruits and, you know, they, they develop. I think that's kind of what downplayed towards Paul Rhodes is doing is that, you know, some of these guys that were at least sort of highly touted, they just weren't developed properly. And then he kind of stretched in his last final two years where he was just trying to go the JUCO route just to fill some voids that were left by the non-development of these younger guys. So it's all going to come down to kind of development. And you can see that from other programs, especially like Kansas State. You know, Kansas State typically doesn't have a high-flying recruiting class, but they always seem to pull out seven to nine wins a year. So, I mean, it all always comes down to development and especially in a school like Iowa State where you're not getting those five to four-star recruits all the time. So I think that's we're going to see that play out over the years if, if uh, Matt Campbell and his staff can develop these younger guys, and if they can, all the merrier for us. Before I get you out of here and we talk about expectations for next season, I want to bring this up. And Iowa State's had some pretty significant success against Iowa in the last five or six seasons. They've lost the last two games. And like when I get on Twitter and I see what Wide Right Natty Light and some of the Iowa blogs going at it, like I had no idea that this was such a fierce rivalry. How could you explain what that rivalry is to somebody that doesn't follow Iowa or Iowa State? Because it seems pretty heated. Well, you know, in Iowa, we don't have an NFL team. So when all you have is Iowa and Iowa State, things get a little um, little heated, like you said. So, you know, Iowa and typically has kind of held charge of this whole series. And, you know, previous years, you know, the last, at least last 20, I think we've, we've kind of been back and forth at least. So I'm hoping that Matt Campbell can keep that streak alive hopefully take kind of a little bit of charge of it, but who knows what will happen here in the next years. But, you know, you walk outdoor, you'll either see a Hawkeye fan or a Cyclone fan. So it's just one of those things. And the Twitter, Twitter is kind of one of those tools that makes everything a little more um, heated than it should be, really. I mean, for the most part, Iowa and Iowa State fans, and I should say in real life outside of Twitter, you know, they get along for the most part. I mean, except for two days out of the year where they're playing basketball and football together. So... You know, you're either a Cyclone fan or a Hawkeye fan with a little maybe sprinkled in of Northern Iowa Panthers, but no NFL team, things get kind of get kind of crazy. <laughs> How do Cyclone fans feel about Kirk Ferentz? Overpaid is what we feel like he is. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that that's probably a general sentiment from like everybody, even Iowa fans. And I, I know just from from being an Ohio State fan, like Iowa's done nothing to them, but there's just some something about that football program that I just dislike, and it's probably Kirk Ferentz. So like, whenever they lose to Iowa State, I think it was what three or four years ago that they lost the nine six game. Like, it's always great whenever they lose to either UNI or Iowa State, and just Iowa fans go berserk about. Kirk Ferentz and basically his lifetime contract there. Well, it, you know, even if they lose one game, it, you see it sometimes pop up on Twitter. You got the hashtag fire Ferentz. So they're stuck with him. They made the, they made the decision. Gary, no, not Gary Barta. What the heck is their daddy now? Is it Gary Barta? I don't even know. I don't pay that much attention to him. But, um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they put that level ceiling on him that if you win seven games, Ferentz is guaranteed that contract won eight games this year you know they're they're stuck with him for another nine years and now it's kind of looking like his son brian is going to be the coach in waiting after he decides to retire with his moved offensive coordinator so we have a lot of fans for a lot of years it looks like well, well we'll see how that works out for him i would assume not not great or not as well as their athletic department wants but before i get you out of here back to iowa state what is 
an expect or what's your expectation for Iowa State in 2017? And I know it's early, but what's a reasonable expectation as well? Is this a team that has a legitimate shot at going to a bowl game? I don't think six wins is out of the question. I I hope for six wins. I think what the, what the um, how they turned around later in the year with the continuity, the younger guys getting in, they're just going to have that much more experience. And if Jacob Park can take that next level with a you know an offensive line that appears that could have some experience on it you know they're all more for the better of it and i you know they're gonna have a chance to beat baylor baylor should be down a little ways you know you got to beat northern iowa first game of the year and anything can happen after that but my expectation and other people's is as well six wins to get out of the regular season with and then go to your bowl games so i'm looking for six wins but you know if they get five wins so be it you know the next year three has to be a bowl game no matter what program definitely on the rise would like to see them make a bowl that is matias schwarzkopf if you want to find any of his work you can do so at wide right natty light.com also on twitter at wide rt natty lt and if you want to holler at matthias on twitter you can do so at m-a-t-t-h-i-a-s w-r-n-l that's matthias w-r-n-l matthias thanks for joining the show man i really appreciate it yeah, thank you. And uh, now that you say you're an Ohio State fan, um, as of all Iowa State fans, we um, we do not like Aaron Kraft for hitting that buzzer beater on us in the NCAA tournament a few years back. So I just wanted to make that known. <laughs> Honestly, like about 10 minutes ago, I was thinking about asking, you know, like, should I end the podcast with what, do you, what does he think about the charge? <laughs> and I know, I know, like I have a couple of friends who are Iowa State fans and they like to say they were less than pleased with that call is like an understatement and I know it, it wasn't a charge. It wasn't a good call, but I will certainly take it. That's, <laughs> that's one of my fondest memories of Ohio State basketball, and they, they don't have many over the last couple of seasons, but that was a game that'll go down in, in tournament legend or infamy, depending on uh, your, your side of the coin there. We will forever have some hatred for Aaron Kraft. <laughs> hey, you and everybody else, man. You, you guys aren't the only ones. All right, Matthias, thanks for joining, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. There it is. I want to thank Matias again for joining me to talk Iowa State football, and you should definitely check out everything he does on Twitter at Matias W R N L, and everything that Wide Right Natty Light does on their website WideRightNattyLight.com, and on Twitter at Wide R T Natty L T. Definitely a fun podcast to record and to get some more insight on where that program is headed. And personally, I, I'm definitely on the lookout for what they do next season in terms of Matt Campbell's job prospects because I do think with what he did at the in the MAC at Toledo and even with a 3 and 9 season in his first year at Iowa State I think that they showed good signs of improvement and if they're able to do that again and even make a bowl game or get close to a bowl game maybe next season isn't a, a year where he uh, he gets a, another head coaching job, but I do think he is a name that is on the rise and will be on a big team's radar here in the next two or three years because I definitely think he has the pedigree, and like Matthias said, he knows how to connect with those recruits, and it's not like his, his schematics are far behind either. He's, he's definitely a coach that is good with the recruiting and the off-field kind of stuff and can definitely bring to the table from the X's and O's standpoint as well, so... Definitely a rising name in the head coaching ranks, and one if you're not an Iowa State fan, you should be on the lookout for because he is a good one. That'll do it for the podcast this week. want to thank you all again for listening, and if you do enjoy listening and you enjoy the Two Stripes podcast, I would highly encourage you to go to the podcast app, subscribe, leave a review, leave feedback, any sort of comments, questions, concerns, anything helps. It definitely does at the end of the day, and I'm interested in hearing what you guys think about the podcast and what I can do to make this better for you, the college football fan. Also, you can check it out at soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. You can listen from your computer, your phone, your tablet, whatever device you have, you can listen from there as well. That's soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. That's it for this week, though. I'll be back next week with another off-season series preview. 
and continue rolling throughout the long, desolate college football offseason. My name is Colton Denning. I want to thank you again for listening. This is the Two Stripes Podcast. I'll see you next week. Thank you.